today. Allow, mm -hmm. Allow me to take a moment and respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland, as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothuk. I would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut and the Innu of Nitasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the people of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. And in many ways, today's presentation is about the beauty and the interesting bits and pieces of the beauty in Peninsula. As you all know, the Thriving Regions Partnership process is the Harris Center's uh, main regional development program. Uh, the pandemic really messed up how we do this. Um, normally, this would have unfolded over a period of about 18 months. There would have been many more in-person meetings, uh, but we were forced to do much of this online. And um, I can't thank you enough for your patience, but also for your indulgence as we were trying to figure out uh, how to accommodate our researchers and help them do what they wanted to do and how to provide value to you as our community partners, because that's what this is all about. So today we are going to hear from Dr. Maria Louise Astrep and Simon Cominelli. They're both from the Department of Geography. Uh, are you getting used to being called Dr. Maria? Not quite, but you know, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> A newly minted Dr. Maria Louise Astro. Uh, they're both from the Department of Geography and they're going to tell us about their project, Culture, Nature and History, identifying sustainable tourism opportunities for the Burien Peninsula. Uh, as you know, originally Dr. Christine Knott was supposed to be part uh, of this event and do her own presentation. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it. Uh, so we are going to organize a separate session for her project. And before I hand this over to Marie and Simone, uh, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. I have them written down because I always forget. Uh, we are a small group, so we are running this as a Zoom meeting, not as a Zoom webinar which means that you will be able to just raise your virtual hand or your real hand, if you turn your camera on, uh, and ask questions after uh, their presentation. And uh, we are also recording this session, so it will be available on the Harris Center website and YouTube channel. Uh, so in case you have to leave, you can watch it later, or if you want to share it with others in the community, you should be able to do that in a couple of days. Uh, we let our researchers present for about 10, uh, I'm sorry, 15 to 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. And, &A. and uh, Maria and Simone also have some in questions for you folks. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that uh, conversation as well. Uh, I'll shut up and why don't you two guys take it over. And now you can hear me as well. Well, welcome everyone. We're really excited uh, to be here in this virtual space with you. Um, as Bojan said, my name is Marie-Louise Ostrup and I am here with my collaborator, Simone Cominelli. Both um, are, were, I mean, I, I was a can PhD candidate in, in geography at MUN and now I'm, now I'm done and Simone still is a PhD candidate at MUN. We're really excited about this project because um, we would like to showcase how physical and cultural geographers are, kind of can work together um, to talk about tourism. Um, and just to set the stage a little bit, because this project has really um, evolved um, with the pandemic, we kind of had to uh, rethink our, our, prison, our, our approach a little bit. Um, but as you might recall, um, this is all based on uh, needs, research needs that were identified by you as a community. And our work falls under the um, community identified theme, realizing our tourism potential. Um, and you also identified some sub themes that are really important um, for how we chose to frame this work, particularly around um, the tourism network on the Buren Peninsula, um, studying the existing inventory and marketing efforts, um, how you look to the market, these kinds of things. Um, you highlighted the need for regional sharing and collaboration um, and promoting tourism and communities. 
and capture the stories of the peninsula. So we're just going to give you a little bit of insights into the work we've been doing. And then we have some questions for you because we want to make sure that um, our end product reflect what you guys are interested in. So our research goal was really to understand sustainable tourism opportunities for this region um, by assessing what's there, what are the gaps, and what are the opportunities. Um, to, to do that, we used what's called a gap analysis. So we basically mapped out what's there and what's not. Um, and we looked at different things so like accommodation. We looked for BNBs, hotels, but also Airbnb listings. And we looked at restaurants and cafes, both, both local and franchises. We looked at different amenities like grocery stores, gas stations, um, hospitals, and so on. We looked at cultural landscape features, monuments, historic square, squares, um, entertainment like museums, um, nature-based uh, activities like uh, our areas like parks, protected areas. And we looked at trails and um, for both hiking, walking, and ATV. We got our data. Um, from a few different points. Uh, first of all, from the survey we distributed a while back now, um, there are 10 out of 23 registered um, tourism operators in the region that, that filled it out um, and helped us understand some key attractions. We're gonna come back to that in a bit. Um, then we used Google Maps, simply open Google Maps, search for restaurants, zoomed in on, on places to um, be able to record the coordinates. We used the website All Trails for hiking trails. Um, and a bunch of tourism websites included Airbnb, uh, lighthousefriends.com, which has like a listing of lighthouses in Canada. Um, of course, like uh, uh, provincially relevant uh, tourism websites as well. And then we used spatial data from, from different websites, for example, for road networks. So our work that was already done that we could build on. Um, all of this um, fits in also with the Buren Peninsula Tourism Development Plan from 2019. Um, in that it was highlighted the need for identifying gaps and opportunities in the visitor journey on the Buren Peninsula. So when Simona in a bit will present our maps, you can see um, how, how these maps tie into exactly that. Um, but also to establish a network of natural and cultural attractions because at the end of the day, our findings um, can help identify how far away um, accommodation is for different kinds of attraction and where there are gaps in, in the region. Um, but when we do all of this, there's a few perspectives that we wanted to make sure were included and thought about in, um, in the way we made our maps. Uh, one part was uh, what tourism operators said was important. And another one was looking at our visitors. Originally, we planned on, on collecting that data ourselves, but um, here we are in the midst of a pandemic and it wasn't an opportunity for us. So we are kind of uh, leaning on, on the government of Newfoundland and Labrador's um, research on that. And they had some really exciting new numbers come out about uh, resident visitors. And I think we can all agree at this point, perhaps more so than we would uh, when this project started, that um, resident visitors are very important for sustainable tourism. And we're currently in a situation where we have experienced a few tourism seasons where uh, we were almost entirely dependent on people already, uh, in, tour, in province tourism uh, staycations, right? So the most memorable experiences um, that staycationers had in Newfoundland um, in, last, in last tourism season last year was to spend time with friends and family, it was outdoor activities. It was enjoying the beauty of the province, um, eating local foods and seeing wildlife. So um, these are all things that we have to keep in mind when we were making maps. Most visited places um, included local restaurants, hiking trails and beaches. Um, so let's also keep that in mind that this is what um, people from the province were interested in when they were visiting other places in the province. And they primarily participated in activities around hiking and walking. So that just goes to show that these are really important um, things to offer, including um, different kinds of like uh, wildlife watching. Um, so in the survey, we handed out or we distributed online what feels like a very long time ago at this point. We asked uh, tourism operators to identify what was really important to be within walking distance, uh, a short driving distance and medium driving distance. And um, we found that people were 
found uh, tourism operators found it important to be within five to 10, 10 minutes walking from museums and from cultural landscape features like monuments, fishing stages, our historical squares, uh, these kinds of things. For shorter driving distances, so 10 to 15 minutes, you said it was important to be close to natural uh, sites and hiking opportunities, and again, cultural landscape features. And for longer drives, you said cultural landscape feature features and kinds of organized recreation, like it could be things that aren't hiking, uh, it could be like golfing or these kinds of things. So that's what our, that was the input we got from um, tourism operators. And we're hoping today is an opportunity to get even more input from, from, from people that are involved or interested in tourism in the region. So we kind of took these two perspectives, what are visitors looking for, what are tourism operators saying are important, and uh, what exists in the region, and how can we map all of this? So in a bit, uh, Simona will, will uh, introduce us to some of the maps. Uh, you're just seeing the driving-based maps, because if not, we could be here for a very long time. Um, but we would really like you, as we're going through this, uh, if you see that there's anything missing or anything that isn't in its right place, because this is based on data we have sourced um, online, uh, just raise your hand, let us know, or make a note of it, and we can talk about it later, because we would really like to, to get that feedback from people that have spent, that, that are in the region, that spend more time in the region than we are, because we want to make sure that this really reflects what you're looking for. Uh, and on that note, I will uh, pass it over to Simone. <laughs> Thanks, Mary, and I'll ask you to go to the first map and next slide. Okay, so now we will look a little bit um, at how things look in space, uh, starting from uh, tourism preferences and what you highlighted in the questionnaire. We built uh, a database of places, and to give you a little bit of orientation on these maps, uh, the shaded colors you see, thanks for pointing them, uh, are the um, municipal boundaries for the municipalities that we focused on, which are the ones that make the loop uh, on the Burien Peninsula. And what you're seeing here in this first map is the distribution of accommodations. And you have bed and breakfast, uh, uh, hotels, resorts, cottages, and suites. And then, and suites. And then you can see there's uh, a last item campsite uh, this is the latest addition, so this is not reflected in the, in the maps we will see later on, <clears throat> but it's something that we would like to include as well as camping, if you remember, is one of the activities that was highlighted by the latest statistics. So this one map gives us a, a snapshot of where accommodations are in the area, and if we move to the next one, then uh, what we focused on was two big groups of attractions, what we consider to be nature, natural attractions. So uh, hikes, um, points of interest, there can be viewpoints, um, and then uh, landscape features. Um, uh, so, and you can see, again, like how they are distributed in the area from these maps. And, I will go a little bit quick on this, but we have plenty of time to go back. And if you have specific questions, we can pull up the map and we can look at it for, for a bit more. Um, the next map uh, is similar, but focusing on what we uh, define cultural landscape items or places. And these include um, heritage buildings and historical buildings or places that are tied to the history of the Burien Peninsula. Then from previous analysis, we knew that tourists are particularly interested in seeing uh, lighthouses in, uh, in Newfoundland. So we added that, those ones in, and then we looked at uh, where museums and theaters were. And also uh, I decided to add the uh, uh, wind farms you have because it's something that you don't see very often in, in the provinces. It's, it's a nice side for some people, at least. Now, what we have seen so far is where things are. Uh, but then the questions we asked ourselves were, where are the gaps? So, and where are the opportunities for developing this tourism network further? So the way we looked at these two aspects is taking the 30 minutes uh, drive limit 
that we identified from the survey and then translating that into an, a map of the network. So every line you see here is the road distance, the travel distance that it will take you from going from one specific accommodation in one of the communities to uh, an attraction. In this case, the map you're seeing focuses on the natural attractions. And um, it looks a bit messy, but there's good information that we can draw from this. Uh, I will move to the next slide that helps a little bit. So at the large scale, we can see that there's two nodes in this network. One is located on the top right, and it's mainly centered around Marystown, uh, Burin, and Lewin's Cove, and it has Garnish and Frenchman Cove at the periphery. And you can tell that this is the case uh, because if you look at the lines, they are color coded based on the distance. So green lines are cr close to five minutes walk distance or very close in terms of driving distance to the accommodations. Uh, red lines are close to our uh, 30 minutes limits or 25 kilometers uh, of driving at uh, 50 kilometers per hour. Um, besides this uh, big node here, then there is a more of a distributed network on the other side of the peninsula where some communities are well connected for access uh, to natural attractions like between Grand Banks and Fortune or other communities like St. Lawrence can be seen as a hotspot for natural activities. But then if you focus on the communities that happen to be in between these two, between St. Lawrence and Grand Bank, then the network starts uh, becoming a little bit more uh, slim. There's not as many uh, good connections between accommodations and attractions. Um, we did a similar thing looking at uh, the cultural attractions, and you can see that um, this fragmentation is a little bit more pronounced for cultural attractions. We still have, and I think, yes, thanks. We still have the uh, node for uh, between Burin and Marystown. Uh, and again, like Frenchman's Cove gets excluded from it in this case. Garnish is still connected, but not super well. Grand Banks and Fortune have a very good, uh, say, connectivity between, between them, but they are kind of isolated. And the same happens in the southern part uh, for St. Lawrence, Lord's Cove, Lawn, Point of Gold, and Lama Line. And another thing that happens is that the gaps uh, that we saw earlier in the natural attractions map uh, grow a bit bigger. And also there's two communities, Frenchman's Cove and Point May, that become kind of disconnected from, from this half an hour drive concept of the network. Um, and I think that in, in general, I wouldn't see the, could we go back for one second? Um, yeah, so, I know I made the distinctions between gaps and opportunities, but I, I want to specify that by finding the gaps, then we get a, a good idea of where it would be worth developing the tourism network more perhaps, and also where uh, we already have something that has been, that is in place and that we can build on to expand this network. And it's also worth to note here that this is all based on driving distances. So yeah. our, we will also develop a map, um, you know, for walking distances, but then it's going to look even more fragmented. But it's just a, this is just like a, a one of the many opportunities in terms of like how we can understand and 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 visualize the network. Yeah, and if we can go to the next one and tying on what Marie just uh, just said, there's uh, a number of options that we have to build on this uh, first run of. Uh, our network analysis. We looked at distances to hiking trails, for example, but we have information on the restaurants and the type of restaurants that are present and uh, uh, a number of other amenities. So access to 
uh, gas stations or distribution of grocery stores, or also thinking about uh, hospitals and other kind of services. So this is one of the input we would like uh, from you guys today is trying to frame a little bit more what should we focus on. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a number of things that we can look at and we can look at them in terms of driving distance, but also uh, we can work more complex kind of costs into this analysis. So if there's something related to uh, walking on foot versus having a vehicle, um, or uh, now I can come up with any other viable example help. of this. If you remember from the um, visitor survey that was recently done, our province right of like uh, resident visitors, one thing was like local foods. So we could look at like how far um, is accommodation from local food opportunities that aren't franchises. So like maybe we have like a map that includes like Tim Hortons, McDonald's, uh, these kinds of opportunities. And then one that includes like local cafes, local restaurants, um, independently owned businesses. So that would be one, one way of like understanding um, the network in a bit more detail and also are focusing on um, what visitors are interested in. Yeah, and uh, Chris, I'll, uh, I'll take the question. Um, so we consider tours, organized tours as part of the services. So they are not uh, in the maps that you've seen so far, but we have them in the database. And that is one of the things that we could look at if you're interested into that, is mapping the, the offer for uh, organized tours and then look at how that is distributed between the different communities. That is a very good point. And I just wanna, I mean, before we, we start our conversation, I also just wanna share our email addresses. So um, if you know of um, organized tours, we would also like to know about them because we are limited by what we can find online and, and you know how algorithms work. It's not always that you find all the information that you're interested in. So that's the kind of stuff that we would also be really interested in, in getting more information about. Um, yeah, so thank you. Any questions on this? Um, comments, thoughts? You can folks oh. either wave your hand or you can raise your virtual hand. We have one question in the chat. Oh, just Tonya making a comment um, that she owns New Age Rentals and Adventure Tours and they do rentals and boat tours. Yeah, and if I remember it right, that one is in Fortune, right? And I think we have that one mapped. Garnish. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember finding it. Actually, it wasn't super easy to find it, but yeah, I remember finding it on uh, on one of the destination websites and it's in there. And one of our hopes with this is also that we can um, find someone to host this information so it can be a living map. Like we'll of course get all the distances calculated, but if we can um, uh, if we can find a host for this, we can make it so that anything that is coming up can be included. So we're also working on what's called a story map. So it's like an interactive fun map where you can click on different spaces and then you can like see nice pictures. So we are, um, we're working uh, on doing that. We have created, um, we have some information for a winter kind of, what can you expect to see in Buren in winter time? We're hoping for a bit of better weather so we can get some sunny days as well. Um, that kind of also highlight um, things uh, from some of these gaps. So for example, Frenchman's Cove is actually where, this is the area where we took the picture in the background and it, it's an incredibly beautiful area. We have um, also material from Point May that just can help like uh, promote the Buren a bit more and like, um, yeah, maybe spark interest for people. Yeah, and I, I'd say that one thing is that, you know, by looking at this map, maybe one can jump to the conclusion that there's, nothing there but we don't believe this is the case there is a lot i think that can be built upon to to uh, improve the network it's just 
not super straightforward to uh, figure out what is there and what one can visit. So any kind of input on um, attractions that we might have missed or, or things you think are uh, worth bringing to the foreground for, uh, especially for the Point May area and around Frenchman Cove, I think that would be wonderful. There was just a suggestion, Simone, from Irene to also include gift shops that feature our locally or NL made products to be mapped. And I think that's yep. great. It would be also, Eileen, if you if you wouldn't mind reaching out, it would be great because maybe we can have an opportunity to um, collectively identify those places. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth and then from uh, Chris. My question is related to um, the fact that none of the existing attractions below Marystown are included. And in the years that I've been involved with tourism on the Buren Peninsula, one of the biggest concerns that get raised is the distance to the nearest attraction or the nearest accommodation. And we've been trying by building in the direction towards Goobies to shorten that gap so it makes it more attractive to come down here to a tourist. If you look at this and you're in Goobies and there's nothing until you get to Marystown, it could be discouraging. Like there are uh, Airbnbs in Southeast Bight. There's a cabin rental on the Pitty Fort Road. There's hiking and ATV trails below Marystown. Um, none of this is included. And really you're looking at like 30 to 40 kilometers from Marystown. Yeah, we can definitely look at also including the stretch from the highway um, and, and down to make sure that that's, that's, that's a really good suggestion because that is also some of the, the, uh, the previously done work in the region also kind of talks about um, that stretch being um, one of the more tricky things to to um, to market because it is a bit of a long drive, but it's also an incredibly beautiful drive, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're hoping that we can get from the um, story map portion of this is also something that can showcase um, that it's actually really worth driving driving down um, because that is like a it's a very beautiful area too. Any other questions from the audience before I go to Chris's question? Uh, Cecilia says, should there be some indication as well that we have an international border in Fortune with access to France? I, I think that's a, a good point. Um, but what, what we focused on since some of the things that come out from the, um, from the work that has been done also through the Harris Center for Buren is that there's a little bit of uh, skewed interest towards St. Pierre Miquelin. Um, and I, I think that is valuable information that should be in here, but I would, I, I guess the, the end goal would be to make the Buren Peninsula an independent tourism attraction and yes, have the connection to St. Pierre Michelin, but point Thank on the you. fact that tourists can just spend their holidays here without necessarily needing to go in France. Uh, Chris's question, uh, and this is a question for everyone, presenters and all participants. How can you envision this information and products being used to promote different or more tourism in the Burin region? Does it suggest different strategies or approaches? It's a big question. Um, if I can mm -hmm. make an example, like when I was looking, and maybe it helps going back to the map with the um, hiking trails. Um, when I look at this, I'm I kind of try to compare it to other opportunities on the island. And if you make, uh, if you compare this to a place like the Irish, uh, the Irish Loop and the East Coast Trail, there is some sort of continuity from one hike to the other so that 
a tourist that comes in can do the entire thing um, and stopping in communities, resupplying and going to the next one. So I think one thing that can be developed from these results is to make it so that we have a network of trails in Buren that are connected and allow people to move from one community to the other, for example, and stay in the community and then do the next uh, leg of the of the trip. Um, and I think at least to me, this is what the, this map told me mostly is that with a maybe a few targeted trail developments where we see that the big gaps are, uh, this could become something that uh, makes people more interested in doing the entire tour of the of the bureau. And I think perhaps also um, looking at what has worked really well in other parts of the province where there's um, um, places where they've really done a good job of promoting local foods and like a diversity of like, for example, high quality dining could be something that could also be considered um, for, for the Bjorn Peninsula. I mean, on, the re on our recent trip, we were we were there in winter time. So of course, uh, not as many restaurants will be open, um, but having greater food availability of like, and variety might be a, a, also a way of attracting people. Because if you remember, it was almost 70% of people of resident visitors are in Newfoundland that had um, sought out local food opportunities. So that, that might be something also worth uh, thinking about. Um, and I could just see that there's, I mean, that, do anyone else have uh, anything to add on that? Uh, I would be interested in also knowing how, uh, how participants are finding this and, and think that this could be useful. Yeah, and I was just reading the uh, the latest comment on the chat, and we, yes, we did uh, look at the interactive map uh, from the province. Um, I do think, though, that there are, especially for for trails, there are more trails in the map we have here than what the province has. Um, but it would be good to have a full list of everything that is, if, if that's, that can be uh, shared with us, having a full list of what is mapped in the province website, that would help us also, yeah, cross-reference and make sure that we're not adding things that are not there anymore or missing things that have been put in place in the meantime since we started the project and um, we couldn't catch. Hmm. Yeah, but there might also be that, um, I mean, we did find some of the accommodation offers that aren't necessarily registered. I mean, we, we don't know, but we did also find some on Airbnb, for example. And I know that also registered businesses, to my to my knowledge, sometimes use Airbnb to promote um, their accommodation offers. Um, but we, we don't know exactly that everything um, is registered, right? Because that's not the information. We don't have access to that kind of information. Um, but I do, I do, I do recognize, and I'm aware of the kind of the challenges around um, being a registered versus not a registered business. Um, so that is something we have kept in mind. And folks, I just yeah. want to remind you that we are actually not in a webinar; we are in a Zoom meeting. You can just jump in and talk, you know. <laughs> uh, I might. Could I? Do you hear me? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's nothing like having uh, an actual visit and uh, from those of us who have worked on a regional level with tourism associations and partnering in different projects, um, we, can, we can see gaps. And if you're not getting responses um, to individual um, items that are being raised, it's because I, I think we understand that you haven't had a chance to come in and get the, the real feel of the actual working settings, but uh, there's there's certainly a bounty of information um, listing all of, you know, most of the major trails and as well as accommodations and um, points of interest that we can access through the Heritage Tourism Associations um, once, once uh, that opens again in May. But um, 
it is the worst gap that I see, and it's no fault of, of any of you. It, a lot of this is the, the COVID years we've been living in, um, is that the whole peninsula isn't included. Elizabeth's mentioned part of it. And um, I, know, I know if you live at the tip of the peninsula at the end of the boot, you might think, oh, it's such a long drive if the road was only shorter. But the road is actually a wonderful asset. It's, it's one of the most beautiful drives. Uh, you can see the effects of the glacier activity. Um, you've got an open landscape. Um, I'm a visual artist in effect, but I always feel like I'm driving through the middle of a painting when I come down the highway. And it's, we have tourists who drop in, visitors who say, whoa, we, we're here. But man, what a road. It was fantastic. I nearly went off the road so many times looking at the, at the uh, settings. There's such a variety of, so it's, I know the, the um, tourism department is, is sort of featuring the geo geological nature uh, as a focus this particular year. And it's a good one at long last, you know, you don't need to have um, a ticket on the door purchase to experience it. And we do realize that we need the amenities where people do spend their money. And that needs investment. It needs entrepreneurs. Um, it, it needs a real secure uh, staff that is on hand that has been trained year after year with experience that comes back and can assume jobs. And there's an awful reliance we've always relied on government programs for staffing in a lot of these amenities, including the cultural heritage settings. Uh, so it's, there are problematic areas that until the flow of cash comes through that we have, we secure all those stable uh, connecting parts. Um, we, we kind of have these little gaps every year. That's, mainly what I think I wanted to say, but uh, yeah, carry on. And I think you're, you know, you're touching base with a lot of the elements that are really important. And we know that, that the food, the um, Newfoundland food or traditional dishes on restaurant menus is really, really key. Uh, but again, it comes back to the entrepreneur who set up that business, who has to succeed the rest of the year yeah. in selling you know, that kind of food, the brown food, they call it. But uh, it's a real mix, you know, and it's an experiment on somebody's budget to try to maintain that population that's going to year round support your business. So it's nothing, all I'm going to say is nothing new under the sun that I'm saying, mm -hmm. but I'd like to commend you for the work that you've been doing. And it's kind of interesting to see all this, the mapping particularly, uh, there are a lot of groups that do connect really well with each other and uh, promote not just their own thing, but they connect with uh, a lot of entities throughout. And um, that's, I know there are real key players here on this, uh, on this forum, and I hope they speak out. Uh, I was glad Liz did, St. Pierre Miquelon. We're joined at the hip in tourism, so I don't know where you have to begin and end. And I'm sure there was somebody given directives as to where you have to begin and end in your research, but it doesn't matter. We are still joined at the hip with St. Pierre Miquelon and there's partnerships all over the place that are gonna reinforce that. And I think that's great, right? It's an opportunity also for cross-promoting uh, two destinations, um, you know, in one. Um, mm -hmm. You said a lot of interesting things, so I'll just try and see if I can remember everything that I wanted to comment on. I think you're very right about the drive down, and not only is it beautiful, it's also a really good road, right? And sometimes, um, I think we all know this, the, the road system can be a little challenging, um, but actually uh, we've driven down a few times now in winter time, and it's a pretty good road. I mean, and it's, and it's beautiful, and I think having more opportunities to promote that, especially through like visual media, I know that um, typically the um, the average tourist is a, is in their fifties, but our um, younger younger tourists are like uh, even even local tourists might be um, using different kinds of media, right? So having like pictures that are beautiful and like 
or can give that Instagram or social media effect. Um, I think is a very important part of, of the um, marketing for, for a region because that's that's how it works right these days is that you see a photo and you also want to go there. So it goes on your bucket list because you've seen um, you've seen these beautiful uh, beautiful pictures. Um, yeah, and we hope like I've realized that it's quite complex to set up um, set up a sustainable tourism system um, not only because it's not just a matter of, of like of spatial gaps, but it's also a matter of um, human resources funding, which is we all know that that's that's always a tricky one, but hopefully this can also help in leverage some of that because our, we can at least like visually see that, you know, uh, there might be a need for some trails in certain areas or things like that. But we will definitely expand this uh, to include um, between Marystown and Boobies as well. If I um, may just, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to answer Carl's comment in, in the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so Carl is asking if we have an inventory of the number of accommodation units available and if there's a shortage of accommodation uh, and increase an opportunity to increase the spaces available or opportunity to fill the existing spaces. Uh, so we don't have it here now, but in the final report, we can certainly include that because um, to make these maps, what we did was we went to uh, Newfoundland Tourism website, um, uh, Airbnb and also Google Maps to see if there's anything that wasn't listed. And then we went in for each individual. I can just go um, back here a few slides. Um, you know, we went back and we were like, okay, so in Buren, there's this place. And we took down the, um, the uh, coordinates so that we can include them in the mapping. So uh, we don't have it on like right now available for you, uh, Carl, but we can certainly include that in the in the final report where we can see like how many types of accommodations are there and what category do they fall under. Um, that also gives you a sense of like uh, knowing how many BNBs there are versus um, private homeowner owners necessarily like renting out something on Airbnb. Lots of bees in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can go back to the the only thing I wanted to remind everybody is, and it's been two years, so we all forgot, uh, the, the scope, the sort of what constitutes the region, um, that was the planning committee that kind of put a boundary on it. Um, we're not bound necessarily. It's really interesting to see how that conversation is changing when you talk about tourism, right? Maybe it's different when you talk about, let's say, aquaculture. Um, so it's really interesting to hear that you know, there is a need to consider Buren Peninsula as some, as extending north of Marystown towards the highway, but also we cannot disregard St. Pierre and Miquelon because it's such a huge portion of what tourism draw is there. So just a quick reminder, that's how we got to the boundary through our conversation with the uh, planning committee, but that doesn't mean that those boundaries hold for every context, which is interesting. No, it's a very good point. We, uh, we often said years ago that if um, St. Pierre Miquelon was sitting in St. John's Harbor, you would see exactly how many persons would, would open their eyes and realize, oh, yes, this is something that is part of our, uh, you know, our agenda that we need to include. Mm -hmm. But because it's on the tip of the Bjorn Peninsula, it's a little bit easier to disregard than upset. Any other questions from the audience? And maybe while we are waiting for the question, um, Maria and Simon, you guys had, um, you are looking for a local partner who would maybe host this information. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what, what kind of a partner are you looking for? What would be involved? Um, well, I think mainly what we are looking for is um, uh, someone that has a website or has uh, the ability of host uh, data online. And there's different ways of doing it. And I started experimenting using ArcGIS online, which is a free online mapping uh, tool. But the, all of the 
uh, the results you've seen in the maps and also more information like the exact locations, what type of attractions for the trails. For most of the trails, we also have the length of the trail and how much time is estimated for uh, doing the actual hike. And all of that, we can package it in uh, a series of data sets that then anyone can take and work on or can take and display on their web website. Um, so in terms of, yeah, I guess the main point is finding, because the university man is not able to take any of these initiatives on. Um, the ideal would be to have someone willing to take this data and make it available for everyone. And one thing I could do from my end is everything I put online, then I can just release it and publish it for public access, but then <clears throat> it would be still tied to us. It would be still something that if, uh, if my account goes missing or it gets erased for some reason, or I forget to renew it, then it won't be available online anymore. So having a third party that can do that, we think it would be the, the best way to keep this alive and let you guys build upon it and also craft it in the shape that you think fits best for, for the Burien Peninsula. Yeah, and we are also making, uh, in the process of making a story map that is interactive, and it would also be great if um, at least the link for that could be displayed on some websites, because it's really just an opportunity to promote um, some of the sites and some of the areas um, um, within the gaps to see, like, to show people, like, oh, this is, this is really a fun and beautiful place to go, and you should, you know, you should make the effort to take that drive down. Um, yeah, and to answer uh, Chris' questions, uh, yes, we would be happy to work with a local partner and follow all the steps of making this accessible to everyone. And Ella said that DMO, the legendary coasts of Eastern Newfoundland, uh, might be willing to utilize this kind of information. So it might be worth a conversation. And I should also point out when, uh, when you guys are done with your research, the final report will live on the Harris Center website. The problem with it is that it's static, so that information will not be updated. Um, and we are absolutely going to promote the story map and um, the work you have done through our own channels. But again, that's not a permanent solution. So a local partner would be, um, would be really great. Yeah, what we're really hoping um, is that we could provide this to, to someone and it could be an opportunity also to update it and remove opportunities that aren't there anymore add new opportunities so that it's like a living, um, a living, um, I'm gonna call it document for the lack of better word, but um, yeah. Right. And we have uh, Dawson Parrot would be happy to put you in touch with somebody within the legendary coasts uh, who might be able to make that decision and, and work with you on. So maybe Dawson, if you can get in touch with uh, Marie and Simon, uh, and maybe you guys can pop your email addresses, that slide, the last slide back on screen. Uh, yeah. That would be great. That would be really interesting. And I think Irene is just making a really good point here that I actually hadn't thought about that there's um, might be an issue with liability for injury uh, with the host of the website. So that I cannot answer that question, um, but that is definitely something to also keep in mind. Um, yeah. All right. Any any other questions or comments? Uh, we have Elizabeth. Were you going to say something? Yes, I just wanted to make the comment that I think that what's done there is really useful from a planning stage, but I. I would see it as more useful to municipalities and to organizations and uh, individuals who are planning to start businesses more so than as a promotional tool for tourists because of the issues with, as Irene mentioned, uh, liability and, you know, the whole idea that 
um, you could, if you use it as promotion, then if some business is closed at a particular time, it causes all kinds of havoc. So, but for someone who's planning to start a business or an organization whose municipality, whatever, it would be really, really useful mm. for that purpose. And as I said earlier, the other issue, I think that it's really, really important that you uh, connect the dots and join this into Goobies. I mean, you have the um, Kilmory Resort. Uh, Woody Island, all of those are in the lower end of the Buren Peninsula, and it makes it like short stops between, rather than looking at, oh, there's this giant distance of 100 or so kilometers to cover before I see anything. Yeah, that's those are really good points, and I think actually it's a really great idea to have, consider the maps we've shown today as maybe planning tools, and we can share it with people that are involved in that. Perhaps like actually reaching out to municipalities would be a great idea. And then perhaps for the story map, which is a bit more fun and interactive with pictures that could be used for promotion, um, because that won't necessarily have like um, a network of trails. It will just have pictures oh, no. from different points um, on the map, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's basically two different approaches. One is a planning tool uh, and the other one that we, we haven't had time to share it with you guys today, but it's more focused. It, it won't have any <clears throat> considerations about, oh, what is missing or where, where are the holes? It will just be more focused on what can you see uh, in the winter in the Burin Peninsula? Or like, why is it worth to visit the Burin Peninsula in the winter as well, and not only go there in the summer, for example? So those are kind of the points that through the story maps we would like to find a way to highlight. And those ones are easier to share because a story map would be just like a one uh, packaged product that then lives on a website and everyone can access. The planning tool takes a little bit more steps to make it accessible, but yeah, they have these two different kind of uh, scopes. Are there more questions or comments? I've, so far, I'm I'm really I'm really happy with the feedback we've gotten. It's a yeah. lot of really good uh, insights into how we can improve this, um, yeah, and make it relevant for for those who might need it. <laughs> can I ask what your timeline is? Do you have sort of a beginning and an end? to not today right now, but I know there's one o'clock and we're close, but in your, your whole research and this part. So that's, yeah, that has been um, one of the fun things about during this, during a pandem pandemic is that we've had to change our timeline quite a lot. Um, uh, late summer, early fall, we will have the final report for okay. this. Our yeah, hope was we got, a, yeah, we got a chance to go, um, go visit Buren, um, Wow, time is such a crazy thing these days. Um, March. It was going <laughs> in March, yeah. <laughs> wait, um, <laughs> wait till you're older. <laughs> yeah, and we would like to come back in summertime so that we can have um, photo material. And we did a little bit of recording of like bird sounds um, from from both seasons. In 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 our two seasoned province, we thought it would be a good idea to have both to showcase like why why is this a fun place to come in winter time? And I and I will say I I thought it was very fun to be in winter time. It's incredibly incredibly beautiful. It's a you know quite magical place uh, when when the snow is there too. Okay, folks. If we have no questions. Uh, I'm just going to thank all of you, first of all, to you presenters. Uh, thank you for the work. Thank you for finding really creative and innovative ways to do this and to keep the project going despite the fact that it has changed substantially from what we talked about all those months ago. Um, thank you everybody for um, showing up today. Uh, for our virtual event. We are hoping to have an in-person event on Buren Peninsula, uh, sometimes late spring or with summer. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, we are running into a small problem of uh, memorial 
um, prefers if we rent vehicles. But there are no vehicles to rent uh, left in St. John's. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have to solve that little problem. Uh, and some of us don't have our own vehicles. Uh, so, we'll, but we'll figure out if we can do something this summer um, and uh, really close this driving regions partnership process uh, on Burien Peninsula. It has really been a privilege to work with all of you. And I hope to see you all sometimes this year in person at least one more time. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and for your patience in this, uh, now that it's 2022 and not 2020 anymore. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, thanks for the awesome feedback and all of the suggestions. Thank you. See you folks. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye.